What is the destiny of these young people? Young people, there is more to God than church and dance. There's something called consecration. I'm intoxicated by the power in that name. That name is more powerful than neutron bomb. More powerful than chemotherapy. That name is more powerful than radiotherapy. I've seen the name work. This is the Transforming Church International. One church making global impact. You never get tired of what you are having, what you are seeing, until you get to see something bigger and better than what you have. The last few days, I've set my heart just when some of you and that's why you need to be careful not to surround yourself with average minds because they will praise you to your early de death I mean everywhere I go oh Reverend Sam even men of God Reverend Sam we're seeing all the miracles we're seeing all this man of God And then I sat down to read about the 1904, 1901, 1902, 1903, 1904, 1905, and 1906 revival. 21-year-olds led by 20-something-year-olds. Evan Robert, 35, pushed the, the Welsh revival. That's that's blew across the nations of the earth. Evan Roberts had to withdraw from school, sir. He was in school. But he got to a point, he said, look, he said, I want to see thousands come to God. He said, I want to see revival in my nation. And as he began a meeting in their church with the young people, and said, young people, enough of this carnality amongst us. I'm talking about youth pastors with passion. I'm talking about youth pastors, pastors of singles and children with fire burning in their hearts. I'm talking about leaders of women's ministry and men's ministry with fire burning in their hearts. Crying to God and saying, God, no. It can't be more than this. Their worship team will pray and say, God, give us songs from heaven. So the worship team will be in the presence of God, waiting for songs of the moment. Not singing songs God has left. If we truly want revival, we need to be exposed to something more. And I saw wherever Roberts would go and spend time in prayer. Throughout the night, I just couldn't sleep. I said, God, I want something more. And you know what amazed me about Evan Roberts? He looked for a man called Seth. And found some other people who had similar passion. And they became friends. And as Evans was... Evans was leading that kind of meeting here. Seth was leading the same meeting somewhere. So the 1904 revival was not just one man, even though Evan Roberts was the one that was popularized. And I, I, dropped, I dropped the book and I said, God, I'm looking for a set in TTC. I'm looking for somebody in this church who is not interested in titles, who is not interested in position. I'm looking for a young man who is interested in setting the nations on fire. Who would say, Papa, I just want to come and be spending time. I'm not talking about just for the sake of I want to be, I'm close to Reverend Sam. You can be close to anything and not be anything. I'm looking for somebody whose heart, whose heart is burning. I'm looking for a woman whose heart is beyond gold and silver and diamonds and, and blings and rings. I'm looking for a woman whose heart is after God. There 
desperate people. People crying for more of God. The only reason I'm here this morning is honestly with a hope in my heart that God will set your heart on fire and that together we can become passionate for something bigger than all of this. The life of a man, shoes. Is that what your life is? Gold wristwatches and Rolexes. The metals we park in our car parks. And the pride of our hearts, the houses we live in. Is, is, that, is that all? If a robot broke down, we said, Lord, bend our hearts. Bend our hearts. He said, if you can bend the church, you can ch touch the world. If you can bend our hearts. I was asking them in a the church where I was talking to the choir in Lagos. I said, I said, is this, as a choir members, I said, is this all your life? Riazals. It's a miserable way to live in the body of Christ. That all you do is come to church for rehearsals and you sing and then you go. Even the rehearsal, there's no passion for it. Can we round up quickly? There must be a hunger in this choir. There must be a hunger in this choir. And I'm trusting God for a day where you stand here and after you finish singing, the sick must be healed. There must be a hunger in this choir that after you finish singing, people are saying, as you are singing, the glory of God is falling. People are being set free. With due respect to those who lead our prayer in the morning, I called the lady in charge of leading prayer. I said, the next time I see casual prayer on this altar, I will fire you personally. And I called her pastor. I said, is this what you want to turn the house of God into? Is, is this how we pray? In a praying house, we, we just come to lead prayer casually. And before we know, the spirit of casualty will take over the church. Somebody come and take announcement casually. Come and lead prayer casually. Come and preach casually. Everything is casual. And so before you know, you create casual members. Let the intercessors know that intercessory prayer is not for Monday. What we learned about intercession is that intercessors arrive before service. And intercessors don't come out of their place of prayer until the service is over. Begging God behind the scene that something must happen on the scene. That ushers will gather together so that was what ushering was all about. Ushers will gather together, mama. And before service, we will pray. And we'll be praying and say, Father, open our eyes. As we are ushering members in, let us see the one that needs you. And I remember how I came as ushers praying. Prayer was going on in ushering. I came, will come and meet us and say, Daddy, I said, yes, I came. And he said, the Lord just showed me 13 people are coming into the church and they are all functioning from the spirit world. They are coming, they are operating from the water world. And the Lord said they are going to be seated in the service. I said, sure about that? Father, open his eyes. Let them find them. Sir, service is going on, not preaching. Akim will go with their team and the fire of God will be pointing at the persons. 13 of them will be picked, no mistake, and be set free in a service. I'm not talking about ushers who need to be set free themselves.
if you've never seen what it is or what it can be, you'll be satisfied with mediocrity. Sir, Mama, we finish ministering. I finish ministering. My pastor's be real service begins after service. Because you will see members lining up, waiting on their pastors, deliverances taking place, demons being casted down, sick being prayed for. People like people are coming to their pastors, not to the pastor, to their pastors. Why, sir? Because when pastors pray, something happens. The 21st century pastor is a title. No fire. No passion. And they say like priest, like members. Every man and Adam begat after his kind. And I said, Lord, is this what I have birthed for you? I said, not in my lifetime will it continue. I will correct it. God set our hearts on fire. We are desperate people. We want more, more, Lord. We are desperate people. We want more. Father, we thank you. Uh, very quickly because of our time, let's get down to Luke chapter 15 verse 11. I'll just read a few verses there and then we continue. And when he came to himself, Father, let please remain standing as we read God's word, please. I want us to read it together after the count of two. One, two, go. Go ahead. Verse 13. And not many days. into a far country wasted verse 14 verse 15 and he went and sent him into his fields to feed swine verse 16 And no man, I want everyone to read it with strength, verse 17 now. Verse 18, let's do that together as your own battle cry. Verse 19. Let's do that together. One to go. Verse 20. And he arose. Come. 
covenant secrets for supernatural revival father we ask that you will awaken all of us every one of us from the priesthood to those in the pew awaken all of us father set our hearts on fire again father may we not become so complacent and not even know it May we not lose our fire and not be aware. Father, for all of us who have lost it, we pray you will set our hearts on fire again. Father, give us passion for your presence. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Please be seated in the presence of God. What is revival? Revival means to live again. Revival means to live means the word reeve means again the word vivia means live so the word revival means to live again when somebody is dying when people come there they will say have you revived him have you brought him back to life again or when somebody's been brought to life after the person is almost like passed away they will come back to say we revived the person we brought the person back to life. My prayer for every one of us here today, from the clergy to the membership, is that you and I will be so will be so humble and honest before our God that we are able to come to a point of recognition and say, Lord, I recognize in my life an aspect of my life that requires a reviving. Could be my prayer life could be my study life it could be the way i used to fast it could be the way i used to preach it could be the time i used to spend in your presence lord something is dying and now i am aware of it and lord i'm going to stop at nothing until i bring it back to life until it comes back to life so the word revival means to live again it means to be awake again. To be awake again. God used to wake me up. I used to be awake in the spirit to know what God wants me to do. Where God wants me to go. But somehow I have lost touch with all of that. I want God to wake me up again. To be awake again. There are people under the sound of my voice. There used to be a time when in your nights, in the dreams, you will even hear sinners crying and, and you will see visions of hell and people going to hell and, and you will wake up and you will do everything to preach to souls. There's someone here today from January up till date, you don't have a single soul. You went after, you got the person saved, brought the person to the house of God as a trophy you are placed at the feet of your master. And you are okay living like that. We are all okay living like that. Gradually, we have become okay living in disobedience. Because the only reason Jesus left us here is that go ye into the world and do what's up. Preach the gospel. That's the only reason he left us here. He did say, uh, go ye into the world and build big churches. No, go ye into the world and preach the gospel. Records have it today that an average church member will be in church for a whole year and never preach the, church, the message of the gospel to a friend. And it's okay. Something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with us. We have lost touch with him. We are no longer aware of our mission. Christians can sit in boardrooms with business partners. In those days, uh, Christians will do anything to reach the unsaved. Now we will do everything to keep the gospel for the, from the unsaved. 
so long as I'll get business. Formally, we pray that God will give us positions so that when we get there, we can use it to preach. Christians have come into position by the help of God and for, for as long as we have been there, the only thing you want to keep quiet is the gospel. Don't want to talk about that. They, they pray, that they, oh come on Lord, they, they pray, they, they spread their mats in your presence and they pray. But you can't open your mouth for a minute to say thank you Jesus. You, are, you know somebody needs to be careful. You need to be sensitive. You are sensitive to them. They are not sensitive to you. Something has happened to us. There used to be a time when as singles, as young people, sir, we use our birthdays as opportunities for winning souls. I don't know if anybody understands what I'm saying here. So we will go to our church and tell our pastor, sorry sir, we'd like you to come to my birthday. My friends will not come to church, but they will come for my birthday. So sir, please, I want to organize my birthday. I want to make it big. I will put cards. My friends will come. And then we invite somebody in our church to come and sing. And as the person finishes singing, we say, oh, my pastor is here. It would be nice if my pastor can just say a word over my life and pray for me. And the pastor would take that moment to preach the gospel, get friends to Christ. Because the only way to honor God with the fact that you are alive is to bring souls to him. See, I'm sounding foreign now. Because it has become foreign. It was our lifestyle. Gradually, gradually, the church has lost it all. I sat through the night and I was asking myself, how did we get here? Including myself. And I was reminding myself how I started with God. God may be doing so much in my life right now, but I'm still saying, God, is this all you can do? How did we get here as a church, as the body of Christ in Nigeria? We have raised materialistic Christians. And no wonder the world insults those of us who are clergy. Because everything you find in the world, you find in the church. And everything you find in the church, you find among pastors. We compete with each other. We fight with each other. We keep malice with each other. Unspeakable things should not, that should not be found in the world. Even among decent people, you find among those of us who are clergy. With great sense of shame and pain, I was watching on video in London how pastors and elders of the church were fighting and beating each other because certain monies that were raised for the building of the church, there was an agreement that they should share it. They all agreed to share. The reason for the fight was that one of them was not giving a share. So we would never have known if not for the fact that his portion was was taken out. That's what we fight for. Members come to church unlike before when an average Christian is coming to church. The first thing you do, you want to come early. You want to spend time in prayer that God will put his word in the mouth of your, his servant for your sake. No, we stroll in when we want. And the only reason we come to church is because of our business acquaintance. We are coming to meet the connection we are coming to make. And there is a generation rising that doesn't know what the church truly looks like. Oh my God. I am asking myself 
my daughter's generation. This morning, I was selling my protocol. This morning, sir, my daughter just woke up and she was super excited. I said, sweetheart, what's that? And she came to me, she said, dad, do you like my dress? I said, yes, sweetie, it's good. And then we got to church again. I noticed she's with her mom. Mom, my dress. I said, Jesus. I said, see, see this one. That, that's all that matters to her about church now. It's her dress. I called her. I called my daughter in the office before I came in here. I said, sweetheart, come. I said, from this moment onwards, it's not just daddy and mommy you should talk to. I said, anytime you dress up, look up and say, Father, are you pleased with me? I said, sweetheart, from today, anything you want to do, I said, don't just see if daddy may like it, if he doesn't like it, I said, so the final person you talk to is him. And as soon as my daughter was coming out, because she was still interested in her dress, as soon as she was coming out, she fell on the ground. I called her back, picked her up. I said, you know, I told you, calm down. That's how they grow up. And the only thing they think when they think about church, a place to go and show my dress. And I ask myself, is it possible that that's what she thinks we are doing? Is it possible? Is it because I lock up my prayer room and she doesn't see me groaning? And the Lord said to me, start bringing her into your prayer room. Let her be there. Let her see you sweat. Whether she under, let, lock her up with you for one hour, two hours. Let her see you groan. Forget about her. And the same thing is happening in church now. The young pastors too. You see them, the only thing they think about now is suit. What is this people put on your hand now? Eh? Wrist band, the wrist clock, everything. It's just pick an average young pastor of the 21st century church, put him here to pray one hour. He'll be lost for words. Take a worship leader. Tell the person, not no instrument, no keyboard. Put a worship leader here to worship God non-stop for one hour. You will see how depraved we are. Take an elder in the church, a deacon, a minister. Put them here to preach from the word of God and preach from scriptures. You will see people dangling from left, center and right. It is the tragedy of the 21st century church. He said, are you not saying now that you are rich? Revelation chapter 3. He said, you are, he said, he said the measure of your, the measure that you, are, you know God now is that you say, I am rich. I have everything. I have a car. I have a house. I have everything. I travel first class. I travel. He said, can I tell you how I see you? He said, because as I look at you through the lenses of spirituality, which matters, he said, you are blind, you are miserable, you are wretched. That's to the member of the church that the pastor honors publicly, our brother who supports the ministry. God says, you are wretched, you are miserable, you are blind. Go to Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3 you will see that the assessment of Jesus for the church is totally different from the assessment we have. Jesus said, can't you pray with me? 
one hour. Jesus said, disciples, you mean you can't tarry with me? Minimum what, ma? Mommy, one hour. One hour. Jesus said, minimum I'm requiring from you is what, sir? One hour. How many hours did he do with them? Three hours. So he was saying that the average hour a believer should pray, minimum requirement of a believer is one hour. Average for a church worker, three hours. He said, pray like that, otherwise you will fall into temptation. Is that not why we're falling like flies all over the place? Sir, our Christian businessmen we leave Abuja. Mommy, you don't want to hear what I'm talking to you about. Christian businessmen will leave Abuja. Papa, pray for me for financial breakthrough. That's why many, the moment they start succeeding, they start staying away from the priesthood. You know why? There are details about their business that must not come to the surface. Business people, sir. Your business people. Your entrepreneurs. Sir, don't celebrate the fact that they are prospering. Question how they are prospering. That is why a wise pastor does not draw too close to members as they begin to prosper. Stay a bit away so that you will not be blinded by their wealth from their true practices. A wise pastor doesn't blind himself when his members are prosper. Stay away from them. That is why Samuel will stay in Ramah. He did not stay in the palace with David. You, need, you will understand that another day, not today. You will see Christian businessmen now. Ma, when they leave church, we drink oh, alcohol nonsense. We drink. Deacons, elders, pastors, business people. Sir, it's Shaka Malakata in church. Meet us where we are drinking. In the hotel. In the Meridian. And in intercontinental, meet us where we drink. I'm not you. We did drink. Christian houses, when Papa Sam is coming, you will see La Casera. When I'm coming to your house, you see Coke. When I'm coming to your house, you see Fanta. As soon as I am gone, your friends are coming in the evening. That is why our own visit. The time for our own prayer for our own is two o'clock. Once we are gone, the real human beings appear from six. That's when you start seeing, you start seeing all, and then by nine, your eyes are seen like this. And, and, then, and then you're going to invite them to church. See, see, see nonsense people. And then your pastor. Blinded pastor too. The pastor too will stand and say, praise God, our brother, can you stand, sir? God bless you, our brother. We, you know, we are proud of this, our brother. And the world is watching the foolishness of the foolish pastor. Young girls in the church, having men who are married in the church, going after them. I will give you the job. But you know, you have to sleep with me. Ah, but daddy, I know mommy. I can't shut up. You know mommy, so what? It's, it's where we found ourselves. I was watching one of the big women of God in this city. One of the biggest churches in, in Abuja now. The woman got tired just about a month ago. She said, I am already aware that they say you all sleep with each other in this church. And she started begging them, enough is enough. One of the leaders of the youth ministries of the most flourishing church in this church, in this country, in this city, called me and he said, Pastor, I have been struggling. He said, Pastor, I can't tell you how many girls have slept with in our church. I am their leader. I sleep with them. It's what the body has become. We are not pointing there and here. We need to start with us. 
Is it possible that you too, gradually, as you look around now, everybody is falling here, falling there. Daniel, this one has bowed. Can I, can I have one Daniel here? Some, can, can anyone, anybody just come as Daniel? Can, can I have some men around me here? Some men, can I, just any of you, can I have some men too here? I'm tired of a status quo. Gotta be more. It's gotta be more. Gotta be more. It's gotta be more than this. So, sir, this is what happened in Babylon. And God is looking for Daniels, Daniela's, that God will bless. The king of Babylon said, Look, as soon as you all hear music, somebody say music. Somebody say, As soon as you hear sound, say sound. Yes. He said, As soon as you hear the sound, and then hear the music. He said, I, I want you to follow the music and worship what the music points you at. If it's a sexual music, listen to the music and just begin to have sex. Is that okay? Because sound leads you to something. Listen to a rock music and, and lose consciousness. Uh, uh. Lose consciousness, listen to a rock. He said, as soon as you hear the sound of the music, the dulcima, as soon as you hear the sound of the cymbals, the flutes and the rest of that, he said, every sound leads to a God that must be worshipped. There's no neutral music. Every music conditions your atmosphere. And connects your soul to something. Wise people are intentional about what they play around them. Papa, I don't know why every night I always see myself having sex in the dream. What was the last thing you listened to? What was the last thing you watched? I don't want to start mentioning some of them. There are all kinds of songs now in this country. The only thing they glorify is sexual immorality. There are songs that as you listen to them, the next thing you're thinking about is who to sleep with. So as soon as you hear the sound, they say fall down and worship. And Daniel said, no sir, I will not worship the God of pleasure in this land. And listen, please look up everybody. And when the king was going to talk to him, the king said, look around you. Now suit you wear. See those who wear suits like you. Bow down. That one is an elder in your church. He has bowed already. A minister too. Bow. Is that one not your high priest in the synagogue where you worship? Bow to, sir. Are those not fellow leaders in your ministry? And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They look around them. Everybody is doing it. Did you hear what I said? Everybody is what? Talk to me. Everybody is what? Some of you know each other's secrets in this church. Can I say it again? Some of you, some of you, the moment you notice that one of you who knows about you very well, it's no longer in relationship with you. It's now in relationship with somebody. The major reason why you're uncomfortable is not because the person has left you. It's because of what the person may tell them. The lady looked at me, ma. She said, Pastor, 
I'm sorry. She came to meet me in the office here. She said, I'm sorry, sir. She said, my pastor is your very good friend. You come to preach in our church, you bless us. She said, if my pastor gets to hear what I'm telling you, he will faint. I said, what's that? She said, I'm the closest protocol to my pastor. I said, so what's the problem? She says, I'm a lesbian. I said, okay, that, I, that's all right. Thank, thank you, sir. Stand up, please. I, I said, uh, one of my training is never to show surprise. I, I said, that's okay. Um, she said, no, sir, that's not the only issue. She says, sir, I am ready to be free. When I heard your message, I decided I to, enough is enough. She said, but sir, the only challenge I have is that I don't want my friend to go to hell. I said, which of your friend? She said, my lesbian friend. I said, where does she worship? She said, no, she's in our church. I said, really? She said, she is the most powerful praise worship leader. And I know, yes, I know the lady. She's the most powerful. Is there any time she leads praise, the church is her gog. She said, pastor, can you help me save my friend? I said, if your friend is willing like you are, and I invited the friend to this church here. I said, your salvation are independent. And the friend came. I said, God bless you. I celebrate the gift of God in your life and all of that. I said, your friend told me that two of you are lesbians. I just need to tell you straight. Ah, she looked at me. She said, yes, sir. I said, how long has this been? She said, been together for almost five years now. I said, that's great. And I said, uh, how did you get into this? She says, uh, since I was nine years old. She said, I'm the vice chair to the lesbian association in Abuja. The vice in Abuja here. You see this lady? She's on your Instagram. You follow her. It's not from my mouth, you hear. Vice chair. I said, how, when, when did you say? She says, I started at age nine. Where? She started in a Christian school. I think I once mentioned it to daddy. She started in a Christian school in the western part of Nigeria. Owned by a man of God I respect a lot. She says, sir, in that school, many of us come out as lesbians. She said, we all have assembled in Abuja. He said, we have a huge network. Yes. She says that we are spread across churches. She says that we have a way by which we operate. I said, how do you do that? She said, anytime we spot our speck, we will try to study her need. Anytime we notice a girl is our speck, we will study her need. And we have her need. If she needs a car, we'll start carrying her. And we have, we truly want to get her, we'll dash her a car. She said, we can afford it. As sir, we control, we are some of the wealthiest girls in this city. That's how when you see us gather together in, as if we're having fellowship, that people will believe that we're having fellowship. So what we do are unimaginable. I guess I'm in trouble right now. I guess I'm looking for trouble. But that's what the church is dealing with now. And I love them. I love lesbians. Jesus loves them. So I've been helping them. So the first one I started walking with her took us a year. It was when I was walking with her that the ones in my house here too began to show up. It was initially that church. And now it became because as the church is growing, I told my wife, I said, this is one that our church is growing. I am not over happy. I'm asking myself, I was telling Pastor John, I said, as I was looking at last week, I was telling Pastor John in Lagos, as, as I see our church growing, I say, I'm asking myself, where are all these young people going to? What is the destiny of these young people? Young people, there is more to God than church and dance. 
There's something called consecration. I met Jesus at the age of 15, young people. Those of you who are young, they may not tell you, I will tell you. I met Jesus at 15. And I have never, since 15, I have never had the reason to go back on any altar to say, God, I'm coming back again. The moment he took over my heart, I gave it to him for life. I've been following this Jesus now for as long. This is uh, 34 years. 34 now. And, and, and I'm not blaming you for, I'm not blaming you for anything. It's the environment. One of the girls, one of my daughters in this house, she called me and I said, how did you get into it? She said, Daddy, it was inviting a sister to come and sleep over with me. I didn't know that she's into it. Sleepovers. Where are you coming from? I went to sleepover. Sleepovers. I said, are you ready to be free? She said, yes, sir. She is on fire for God today. Doing amazing things for God. The other one too has since gone to be on fire for God. She is a multi-millionaire doing business of her own today. A young man came into the church, likable young man. And I like, I like greeting the young man. I said, God, how are you, sir? He said, fine. My time is up. How are you, sir? He said, fine. I said, I like you. He said, thank you, sir. And we got talking. Oh, say, I said, where, where did you, what did you study? He mentioned his course. Where did you school? He said, I school out of Nigeria. Nice spoken. You know, and we got talking. And he says, I'd like to see you. I said, okay. And we got talking. He said, sir, you sound like an open-minded pastor. I said, not just open-minded, open-hearted, open-worlded. He said, can I, can I talk to you on some serious matters? Oh, I said, why not? He said, because I'm a pastor's kid too. I said, okay, fine, let's talk. What's it? He says, sir, I just want to let you know that um, I practice a little bit of homosexuality. I'm into masturbation. I'm into pornography. Oh, I said, cool. I said, those are the kind of things I help people to deal with. Ah. He says, sir, you are not surprised. I said, about what? He says, you need to be surprised. I said, it's just something you do. And it's something we help people out of. And we started walking with him. You'll never know him. He ministers to you today. It's a blessing to your world today. It's a kind of things we deal with. And we need to get to a point where, like the prodigal son, we need to be awake and our life again. Please look at some of my time, guys. Go sit down. Here's what I want to say to you. The Bible says of the prodigal son and he came to himself. I know Sunday services our messages can be so impractical so far-fetched and make us sound as if we're talking to aliens so about aliens. I decided to bring it home so you know it's right here with us. The prodigal son came to himself. Can I say this? And the question was, what am I doing here? I hope a lady will wake up here today and say, what am I doing in this kind of relationship? What am I doing in this kind of, in this kind of lifestyle? What am I doing drinking shisha? What am I doing with cocaine? What am I doing with codeine? How did I get here? My desire today is that you will wake up and ask yourself a question. How did I get to a prayerless life? Now me know they pray again. What happened to me? Now me know they study Bible again. Me that formerly will carry the Bible from page to page. I will finish the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Old, new, old and the New Testament. And look at me, my whole year has gone. And no desire to read the word. How did I get here? I'm in church and I'm not serving. How did I get here? 
I do things in business now that a child of God should not be found doing. How did I get here? The prodigal son said, this is not me. This is not me. He said, I can see what the problem is. I'm far from my father. There's someone watching me right at the back over there, wherever you are. And the major thing is, you just suddenly realize you're far from the Father. When was the last time God spoke to you? When was the last time you heard his voice? This is not to condemn you, it's to awaken you. To say, look, you are better than this. To say, look, you can rise out of this. That there is life more than church. And that Jesus is not coming for those who attend church. Jesus is coming for those who have the life of God at work on the inside of them. said I will rise I will go to my father I am far from my father I want to go back to my father Pastor Sam you have no idea the kind of problems I am dealing with right now because you are far from the father Did I not tell you last week that the prodigal son, the more he started going away from the father, he started spending to get what he was getting without spending. Pastor Sam, I am sick. Well, come back to the father. His name is Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. His presence heals. Pastor Sam, I'm dealing with financial crisis. Pastor Sam, pray for financial breakthrough. I can pray for that to happen. You will get a breakthrough and you break down again. But in the Father's presence, it becomes your lifestyle. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things, all these things, they shall be what? I'm not hearing you. What is the word? They shall be added. For all these things the Gentiles are looking for. But when you look for the Father, they shall be added to you. It is true. Come back home. Somebody's looking at me. Where do I even start from? Prayer life zero. Bible study zero. Everything zero. Where do I start from? Start by turning to God. Before you got married, you were on fire for God. Praise God. Now look at, God has blessed you now with children. Prayer life has gone. Everything. It's not condemning. Marriage is supposed to make you better. Imagine if marriage made my prayer life go down. Uh, everybody should call my wife. I say, what kind of wife did you marry? Am I correct? Sister, how did marriage take your fire away? Oh, Pastor Sam, children, are they a curse or a blessing? Well, let me challenge you in case nobody has ever told you. Have you heard about a woman called Mother Wesley? The mother of Charles Wesley. Have you heard about her? She had 11 children she was taking care of because her husband was irresponsible. Was, so mama, she goes to work and provide for her children and she also said and taught all her children the word of God. All her children became servants of God. 
She taught them the Bible. She walked. She made money. She taught them the Bible. And she prayed for every one of them to be saved. And every single one of her 11 children were saved. A praying mother. Three kinds of women every man needs in his life. A praying mother, a praying wife, and a praying mother-in-law, a praying mother in Israel. Businessmen, it's time for us to come back to the Father. Ministers, it's time for us to come back to the Father. And don't say come back to church. I'm talking about the Father. The Father is the one we have an issue with. We've gone too far from Him. If you sense the need in your heart to return to the Father, just bow your heads. Or just stand to your feet. Let's pray together. Thank you for watching. We hope you were blessed and richly transformed by this sermon. Join us on site and online in any of our centers globally as displayed on the screen. When we pray, there's a God who heeds us. Yeah. When we pray, there's a God to answer. Yeah. When we pray, we prevail, we prosper. Follow us on all social media handles as shown on the screen. Also, don't forget to join Prophetic Prayer Hour with Rev. Sam Oye, weekdays Monday to Friday by 5.50 a.m. West African Time. Join on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram at Rev. Sam Oye. Please invite your friends and family members, for with our God, all things are possible. For more inquiries, visit www.thetransformingchurch.org. We celebrate you. I'm intoxicated by the power in that name. That name is more powerful than neutron bomb. More powerful than chemotherapy. That name is more powerful than radiotherapy. I've seen the name work. This is the Transforming Church International. One church making global impact.